In this lecture, we're going to talk about linearly independent sets and bases. So hopefully you recall that we talked about what it means for a set of vectors to be linearly independent when we're talking about Rn. And all that means is that this vector equation, where the vectors are the vectors in the set that we're talking about, only has the trivial solution. So in other words, the only way that we can make this linear combination of vectors equal zero is if we make all of the coefficients zero. When that's true, we say that the set of vectors is linearly independent. Now we can use the same definition no matter what vector space we're talking about. It doesn't have to be Rn. We take the exact same definition, the exact same criteria, and we use that to talk about a set of vectors being linearly independent in this general case. Let's look at a couple of examples in other vector spaces that aren't Rn. So one of the vector spaces that we've talked about is the vector space of polynomials. So in this vector space, the vectors are polynomials. We can add two polynomials and get a another polynomial, and we can multiply a polynomial by a scalar and get another polynomial. And so here if we have a set of polynomials, where the first one is the polynomial 1, a constant polynomial, the second polynomial is the polynomial t, and the third polynomial is the polynomial 4 minus 2t, then this set is not linearly independent, or in other words, it's linearly dependent. And the reason is, if we look at the vector equation x1, p1, plus x2, p2, plus x3, p3, equals 0, we're going to be able to find a solution to that vector equation that isn't just setting all the x's equal to 0. So what's this going to look like? Well, p1 is the polynomial 1, p2 is the polynomial t, and p3 is the polynomial 4 minus 2t. And hopefully you can see that if we put in negative 4 for x1, positive 2 for x2, and 1 for x3, what we get is negative 4 times 1 plus 2 times t plus 1 times 4 minus 2t. And that really does equal 0. And we made it equal 0 without having to make all of the x's equal 0. And that means that this is a dependence relation and that these vectors are linearly dependent. Another vector space that we talked about was the vector space of functions. So we can add two functions and get another function, and we can multiply a function by a scalar and get another function. So this is a vector space, and this set, which has two vectors in it, one the sine function and the other one the cosine function, that is a linearly independent set. Because if I set up the vector equation, now I'm not going to use x's for the variables here because we've already got x's inside our uh, functions here. So I'm going to use u's as the variables, just so that we don't have x in two different ways. But if I write down u times the sine of x plus u2 times the cosine of x equaling 0, when we say equals 0 here, we don't mean equals 0 for one particular value of x. What we mean is, is the 0 function. So what this would say is, is there some constant that I can multiply by the sine of x, and then another constant that I could multiply by the cosine of x and add those together, and that somehow those would cancel each other out. But there's no way to do that. For that to be true, what would have to be true is that there's some constant times the sine function, where the result is some other constant times the cosine function. But sine and cosine aren't multiples of each other, and so this is no solution other than just setting the u's both equal to zero. And so that's an example where the vectors are linearly independent. Now this leads us to the definition of what we call a basis in a vector space. So if we have a subspace of a vector space, and remember all that means is h is a subset that happens to also be a vector space using the same operations as the operations in v, and when we have a set of vectors, we say that that set of vectors is a basis for the subspace h if two things are true. If that set of vectors is linearly independent, which is what we were just talking about, and then also that that set of vectors spans h. In other words, if we look at all of the linear combinations of those b's, then what we get is h. So if you recall from when we talked about span, this is all possible linear combinations of those vectors b1, b2, and so on, up through bp. We take that giant set of all those linear combinations, and if what we get when we do that is capital H, then we say that this set, script B, is a basis for H. So what are some examples of bases? Well, if we have an invertible n by n matrix, and we give names to its columns, we'll call the columns a1, a2, all the way through an, then that set of vectors, the columns of that invertible matrix, 
forms a basis for Rn. Those columns are linearly independent, and they span Rn, and we know that from the invertible matrix theorem. We know that in an invertible matrix, the columns span all of Rn, and those columns are also linearly independent. We also have what we call the standard basis for Rn, which are the columns of the n by n identity matrix, and that set is called the standard basis for Rn. As an example, the standard basis for R3 is the set of vectors E1, E2, and E3. And again, note that those are the columns of the 3 by 3 identity matrix. So that is the standard basis for, in this case, R3. As another example, if we looked at the vector space of polynomials with degree at most n, so this is similar to the one that we talked about before, except it's not all polynomials, it's just the polynomials that have degree at most n, in other words, degree n or less. Then this set of vectors, t1, t, t squared, all the way through t to the n, that's a basis for p sub n. It's linearly independent because there's no way that we could have a linear combination of these vectors that equaled 0 without having to make all of the coefficients equal 0. And it spans p sub n because any element of p sub n can be gotten by taking a linear combination of these vectors. A common problem that we're going to be trying to solve is finding a basis for a given subspace. And one way that we're going to do that is by talking about what we call efficient spanning sets. So for this example, let's look at these three vectors. So we're living inside R3 here. So R3 is the vector space that we're talking about because these are vectors with three entries. And what we want to do is give a name to the span of those three vectors. As we've talked about, the span of any set of vectors is a subspace. And so this gives us a subspace that we might want to try to find a basis for. Now, something that isn't totally obvious from looking at the vectors, but is just something that you're given here, is that the vector v3 is equal to 5v1 plus 3v2. And what I claim is that we can find a basis for this set H, this subspace H, by simply throwing away V3 out of that span. Now what do we have to show to, sh to prove this claim? What do we have to show to know that this set of two vectors is a basis for H? Well, we need to know that it's linearly independent, and we need to know that this set V1 and V2 spans capital H. Okay, first of all, why is it linearly independent? Well, because this set only has two vectors in it, it's linearly independent if we can show that v1 and v2 are not multiples of each other. But clearly they're not. If we look at v1 and v2, well, v1 has a zero here, and v2 doesn't have a zero in its first component, and so it's not possible for v2 to be a multiple of v1 because neither one is the zero vector. So that's clear, and it's easy because this set only has two vectors in it. As we've seen before, when the set has more than two vectors in it, it's a little bit harder. We usually end up having to row-reduce a matrix, solve a matrix equation to figure out whether or not a set of vectors is linearly independent. But in this case, when there's only two vectors, we just need to know that one isn't a multiple of the other. Okay, so linearly independent check. Why does v1 and v2 span H? Well, we know that if we keep v3 in our set, we know that those three vectors span h. So we know that every, we'll call it little h, in capital H is in the span of the three vectors, v1, v2, and v3. So what we're going to show is that we actually don't need v3. So using the fact that every little h vector that's in capital H is in the span of v1, v2, and v3, what we say is let little h be a specific element of capital H. Then, because of this fact, little h has to be a linear combination of the v vectors. It's a1 times v1 plus a2 times v2 plus a3 times v3 for some specific numbers a1, a2, and a3. We don't know specifically what those numbers are because we don't know specifically what vector h we're talking about, but we know that because capital H is spanned by those three vectors, every element in capital H has to be a linear combination of those three vectors. So a1, a2, and a3.
But now remember on the previous slide we talked about how v3 is 5 times v1 plus 3 times v2. And that means that we can replace the v3 in this linear combination with this expression that it's equal to. So little h is a1v1 plus a2v2 plus a3, but now I'm going to replace that v3 by 5v1 plus 3v2. I'm going to distribute that multiplication and then rearrange. So I get 5a3v1 plus 3a3v2, and now this gives me a1 plus 5a3v1 plus a2 plus 3a3v2. And notice that now h is in the span of just the two vectors, v1 and v2. So in other words, we, we don't need v3 to span all the elements of h. We can get all the elements of h we would ever want just using v1 and v2. Because if we had any v3s, we could replace v3 by the expression in terms of v1 and v2 and get rid of it. This idea of eliminating unnecessary vectors is the primary idea behind what we call the spanning set theorem. And so here's what it says. It says, suppose you have a set of vectors in a vector space v, and let h be the span of those vectors. And so what it says is, if one of the vectors in S is a linear combination of the others, then the set that we get by removing that vector and then spanning the remaining vectors, we still get capital H. And then if capital H isn't just the zero vector, if capital H is any non-trivial subspace, then some subset of the original set of vectors forms a basis for H. So taken together, what this says is that one by one, we can eliminate vectors out of capital S, the spanning set, until we get rid of all of the unnecessary vectors, and the vectors that remain will form a basis. Okay, let's prove the spanning set theorem. So part A says, if we take one of the vectors in S, and remember capital S is the set V1 through VP, which are the vectors that span the space capital H, what this says is that if any one of those vectors is a linear combination of the others, then we can remove that vector from capital S, and we'll, the vectors that remain still span capital H. So just to make the numbering easier, we're going to assume that it's the last vector in capital S that's the one that is the linear combination of the others. It may not be, but if we need to, we'll just renumber the vectors so that it ends up being that last one. So what we have here is this equation that represents that linear combination. So this is just the algebraic way of saying the last vector vp is a linear combination of the other vectors. And now we're going to do exactly what we did before in the example. We're, we're, what we have to prove is that if we throw away v sub p, then all the remaining vectors still span capital H. How do we show that they span capital H? We say, all right, we got to be ready for anything. We got to be prepared. If somebody hands us an element of capital H, we have to show that that element can be gotten by a linear combination of just v1 through vp minus 1. We don't need vp. That's our goal. Okay, well, we do know that if we include v sub p, then we can get x because the original assumption in the theorem is that if we take all the vectors v1 through vp, that does span h. Well, now we can replace vp exactly by what we did before. We're going to take this linear combination and replace this vp with the equation that we had before. Replace that with that linear combination that vp equals just involving v1 through vp minus 1. We'll distribute, we'll collect our terms together, and what we'll have is a linear combination just involving v1 through vp minus 1. And that's all we have to prove. And now part b is just repeating what we did in part a. So if we already had a linearly independent set, then what we have is a basis, because we know it's linearly independent and it spans capital H. Those are the two criteria for being a basis. If it's not linearly independent, then what we know is that one of the vectors in that set must be a linear combination of the others. So we use what we just proved in part A to delete that vector, remove that vector from the set, and then we check again. We say, okay, well, we got rid of one of the vectors that was unnecessary, and so now is my set linearly independent. If not, then one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the others, so you delete that one. Continue deleting vectors until what you have left is a linearly independent set. 
We've never changed what's the span of those vectors because we're only deleting unnecessary vectors. And so what we'll have is a linearly independent set that spans capital H. That's a basis. Now we might be worried, could we possibly end up deleting all of the vectors? Well, at the very least, we would end up with one vector, and a set of one vector is not linearly dependent unless that one vector is the zero vector. And so that's why this criteria of H not being zero is there. Because the only way we could delete the one last remaining vector, if we even got down to one vector, would be if that vector was the zero vector. And so if we assume that H is not just the zero vector, then we'll never delete the last vector, and so we'll always end up with some number of vectors, and that would give us a basis. So this is what we're going to be doing. What we're going to be doing going forward is now looking at some specific special spaces, vector spaces, and trying to find bases for those vector spaces, and we're going to use the spanning set theorem to do it.